Uh, so I'm Matt. Uh, today I want to talk about the Arnold C programming language uh, and how you can compile it to JavaScript. So I'm just curious here, show of hands, who here has heard of Arnold C as a language before? Okay, a handful of folks. All right, how many of you are using it at your day job right now? <laughs> Oh, you, okay, I wanna talk about, okay, so nobody's, <laughs> nobody's programming full-time, that this kind of makes sense. Okay, what about for like side projects, right? So if you wanna get away from the drudgery of using uh, Java or Clojure Script in your J job, who's just side hacking on Arnold C right now? No one? All right, that's cool. You know, it's a pretty new language, so, um, you know, kudos to everyone for showing up here to stay on the bleeding edge instead of learning ECMAScript 2018 or whatever Angular is requiring these days. <laughs> Um, anyway, the Arnold C community is pretty small right now, so I want to show you that there's something to this language and show you that getting started is nice and easy. So, Arnold C plus JavaScript. So, Arnold C, uh, it's an imperative programming language. Uh, it was created by Lori Hardica. I believe he's Finnish. Um, and all of the keywords in Arnold C are based off one-liners from uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. So, since most of you aren't Arnold C uh, programmers for your day jobs yet, I prepared an intro to the language. Don't worry, it's really straightforward. By the end of the session, you're all going to be experts. So here's the archetypal hello world. Um, so you, every Arnold C program begins with the keyword, it's showtime, uh, and it ends with the keyword, you have been terminated. Uh, that's about as good as my Schwarzenegger impressions are, are unfortunately. Uh, to do a C out or a console.log, it's talk to the hand, uh, and then you can put in a string or a number or kind of whatever you want. But it's real nice and easy. Um, if you want to declare variables, uh, you use the hey Christmas tree keyword, uh, which of course is from Jingle All the Way. Uh, and to set the initial value, you use the you set us up keyword. Uh, so in this case, we're setting foo equal to zero and bar equal to one. Um, the only variable in Arnold C is an unsigned integer. So if you want to do something using negative numbers or decimals, you're a little out of luck. <laughs> um, luckily, uh, so it's also like C in that true and false are simply represented, are simply integer representations. So rather than using zero and one all over the place, uh, they, Arnold C helpfully provides macros for both true and false. So I lied or at I lied is false, and no problemo is true. So that's cool. <laughs> if you want to do more complex math, and Arnold C has you covered as well, uh, you have to use the get to the chopper keyword, uh, and then you declare the, the name of the variable that you're trying to set. Here is my invitation, sets the initial value, uh, and then you do math on it. So in this case, uh, get up adds the value um, b to the initial value. Uh, you're fired will multiply that previous result. And then whenever you're finished with your stack of math operations, you use the enough talk keyword to declare that you're done. One thing that's really interesting about Arnold C is to note that there are no, you know, there's no formal complexities like order of operations. Everything happens <laughs> in left to right sequence. So you're going to take four, add B, and then multiply it by two, regardless of what any math teacher will tell you is the right approach. <laughs> These are all the math operations that are available in Arnold C. To add, you do get up. Subtract, you do get down, of course. Uh, to multiply, you're fired. Uh, the division is he had to split, and they just added the modulo operator, which is I let him go. So that's awesome. Uh, you can also do conditionals in Arnold C. Uh, you, can, you have to use the because I'm going to say please keyword, uh, set up a set of statements, and you end your conditionals, your end brace is you have no respect for logic, which I believe is from the running man. I don't remember exactly. Uh, you do have to, whenever you're, whenever you're reading these out, you have to read it out in the Schwarzenegger for, uh, line. So it has to be because I'm going to say please. Otherwise, it doesn't actually compile, which is a problem. Um, Remember, there are no true or false keywords in Arnold C. There's just integers. So uh, the value, if it's, if it's uh, one, then that value is going to be true, and anything else is considered false. So that's how you do your uh, if statements. There's also else, uh, which is just the bullshit <laughs> keyword. <laughs> that's, the, that's the one curse word in this uh, talk, I believe. 
submit it without comment. Uh, you also can declare functions. So uh, you have to use the listen to me very carefully keyword. Uh, and then you can perform statements inside of there. And then you end your function with hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> to call a function, you use the do it now <laughs> keyword, like you do. Uh, if you have parameters that are required uh, for your function to operate, you have to use the I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle <laughs> keyword. Uh, and each of the keyword or each of the parameters will have its own I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle keyword associated with it. So if you had four or five parameters uh, that your function takes, then you would have four or five lines of I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. So, uh, I mean, easy, right? Uh, if you want to return a value, uh, then you have to use the I'll be back keyword, and that will return the value for you. Um, and in order to declare a variable from a function call, you have to use the get your ass to Mars uh, keyword. So in this case, the, re the value of the result uh, variable would be when you call add five function, um, add eight to it, or you know, pass the eight parameter, and then we would print it out using the talk to the hand keyword. The only looping structure in Arnold C is a while loop. Uh, so you have the stick around, uh, and that just, you, that just uh, continues to reevaluate as long as that value is set to true. So you can perform a set of statements, and then you use the chill uh, from you know, the infamous Schwarzenegger movie Batman Forever uh, to, uh, to finish, finish off your statements. So you don't need for loops or you know, anything else, anything more complicated than that. It's the essence of simplicity. So all the stuff that's controversial in ECMAScript 6 and other uh, you know, compiled languages, things like classes, modules, decimals, <laughs> strings, they're gone from Arnold C. So that's the great thing about this language is that it's streamlined for productivity and you're never gonna have any bike shedding discussions about whether, you know, it's, whether it's appropriate to use classes or um, you know, a module system or you know, which library are we gonna use. It just eliminates all of that so you can just focus on getting some work done. So that's, that's really good. It's, it's just gonna solve your bike shedding problems. Um, so the GitHub page for Arnold C uh, has great documentation for everything that's possible. It's all on the main page. You don't need to run through like t dozens and dozens of manual pages. Uh, it includes the most important section here. So for every keyword that's in the language, you can scroll down. Uh, you can click on any of the uh, any of the keywords, and it'll bring you to YouTube. Listen to me very carefully. <laughs> and you can actually see where it comes from. <laughs> This is super valuable documentation. I don't know why other languages don't include this just out of the box. Like, oh, it's so great. So the art, like I said, it has some great uh, documentation on how to get started. All you have to do is create your file, uh, then download the Arnold C jar, uh, run Java. Um, yeah, so this part won't do it all. Right? As modern programmers, we can't use Java for anything that's this groundbreaking. It's like, it's just, it's mixing. It's, it's, it's the Jar Jar Binks of, of <laughs> the Star Wars universe. It just breaks the reality. Plus, even if we wanted to use Java, we'd have a problem. Because the JVM is amazing. What if we know one thing about Arnold Schwarzenegger? It's that he can't be contained to a virtual machine. So we have, oh, that really died, okay. <laughs> Luckily, there's a solution in place that doesn't involve John Connor or time travel. Instead, it just relies on the power of another extremely powerful tool, which is compilers. So a traditional compiler like GCC or Clang will go from a high level language that a CPU doesn't know how to understand natively, like C, into assembly or machine code. So once we run uh, this hello world through GCC, we end up getting some assembly code that kind of looks like this. There's another type of compiler, one that goes from one high level programming language to another. So in this case, we have CoffeeScript here on the left uh, we run it through the CoffeeScript compiler and it gets translated into JavaScript on the right. And then we pass that to a JavaScript virtual machine like a browser or uh, Node.js. So some people refer to these as two separate items. Uh, they call the former compilers and the latter transpilers. Um, I don't really know that there's a difference between the two. You use the same tools when building them. So this, for the sake of this talk, I'm gonna call them all compilers. Uh, if there's anybody that uh, has a problem with it, 
Hi, haters. Uh, so, but here's why I think we can do this. So a brief history of compilers. Uh, the first one was written by Grace Hopper. It's called A0. Uh, it, was, it was written in 1951 uh, for a specific machine that Univac won. Uh, Grace Hopper also invented the term compiler, uh, and she wrote Flowmatic, which was the predecessor to COBOL. So this is a super popular language at the time, uh, and it was the first one that used English language, uh, you know, used the English language for keywords. Um, she argued that folks wanted to write their code in a higher level language than the machine code that people had been uh, used to writing in, in the past. Uh, her bosses said that it wasn't possible, and then she just went off and did it, and it, would, it was, you know, it, it started the, the high level programming re uh, level revolution. So this is really cool. The Computer History Museum, I found out, has an archived brochure of Flowmatic, uh, which I believe is from like 1954 or so. And when you're reading through it, there's, there's this amazing section which shows, here's what Flowmatic is going to do for you. Um, and just reading through it, so you know, you're free, it, it, by using Flowmatic, you're going to eliminate your coding load. You're freed from the clerical drudgery, drudgery to do more creative work. Um, it breaks the communication barrier between programmers and managers. It dramatically reduces the training time that you need in order to actually get started. Right? Does this sound familiar to anyone? Right? This, is, this is exactly the same type of marketing that we've been hearing for the last 60 years. It's just that Grace Hopper and her team already figured it out. We're just living in her world. Anyway, let's talk about what goes into a compiler. Uh, a compiler has three important sections to it. Uh, the lexer, the parser, and then the code translation or generation piece. So let's start by looking at the lexer. So let's start off by thinking of a program as simply a string of characters that are in a file. So what the lexer does is it performs analysis and it breaks them apart into their atomic tokens. So white space is also a token, but it's usually thrown out here as being not meaningful unless you're working in a language that has significant white space like Python or CoffeeScript or something. Um, so in this case, enough talk is a keyword, but it doesn't mean anything. It just signifies the end of variable assignment. So it's similar to like curly braces or semicolons in other languages. Those are still tokens that are identified during the lexing phase of a compiler. So here's what the lexer does, or here's what it converts those tokens to. So get to the chopper is a single token that uh, gets referenced as the assign variable. Uh, the A simply is referred to as a variable, and then you can kind of see what happens. Note that all the other tokens, which are still identified, like white space, new lines, they're all thrown away in the step, um, which is, uh, you know, that's the reason why you can have fun arguing with your coworkers about why indenting with two or four spaces matters, because the lexer doesn't care at all. So the next up is parsing. Uh, so let's take this math statement again. Again, we're taking A, adding four to it, or setting it to four, adding B, multiplying by two. Some of these bits are only useful to close a previous expression, so we can drop them from the parser, so we'll just get rid of the enough talk. And now we can take these expressions and arrange them in a tree structure. So that might look something more like this. So we start off with get to the chopper at the top of our tree. We're assigning it to A, we're setting the initial value, and then we're performing a set of operations. So this is what the parser actually sees. It's just the lexical tokens that are, uh, that are identified during the lexing phase of the compiler. The actual string values in the source code aren't used for this part yet. So this is our abstract syntax tree. Uh, it's also known as an intermediate representation or an IR. So then you actually generate some code. So in our case, we're just going to be transpiling it into JavaScript, so we need to take that AST and convert it into syntactically valid JavaScript code. So again, here's our AST. First we have our assign variable uh, section, then we set the initial value, apply a set of operations against it. So this is what it might look like when you uh, put it into JavaScript, right? So we're gonna use the var keyword, uh, set an initial value using the weird equals uh, value, which JavaScript requires, and then we apply some operations to it. So moving it from a tree structure into the actual um, code, it might look something a little bit more like this, right? So we set our var uh, integer, and then we just apply those operations. And then we have to add all those extraneous characters that inferior languages like JavaScript require, so your semicolons, all those pieces will go in there to make sure that it's syntactically valid. 
Uh, side note, uh, once you start coding all of your applications in Arnold C, you'll never have to have another debate about whether to use semicolons because they're not even syntactically valid in Arnold C. So you just throw them out entirely. So anyway, uh, once we generated what the structure of the code is going to be, we just drop in the actual values that the lexer has identified and we're good to go. Uh, and there's no one right way to do this. It's totally up to you as a compiler and a generator on how you want to do it. You could also make the code ostensibly look like this. You could use the let keyword from ES6. Um, you just have to make sure that, you know, whatever levels of optimization you're going to do, uh, don't break any characteristics of the original language whenever you're generating your code. For example, we couldn't do this without parentheses due to the way that JavaScript honors order of operations, whereas Arnold C just treads its own path. So that's the basics of writing a compiler. You're responsible for lexing, parsing, and generating code. Uh, that's also known as you know, tokenizing, generating your abstract syntax tree, and then creating your new sources. So also a huge caveat, um, this is super entry level how to write a compiler stuff. Modern compilers and even transpilers do enormous amounts of optimization that I'm just bypassing entirely here. Um, semantic analysis uh, also includes things like type checking, identifying if you're using a variable before you've declared it. You know, we're just forgetting all that stuff entirely. If you want to know more about how compilers actually work, there's a good set of lectures available on Coursera. Or just walk around the hallways of a computer science department and start yelling dragon book. Uh, if you see someone screaming, uh, uh, then they've probably learned about compilers the hard way. Uh, I never took a, a class in compilers, so my, my mind is pure to just focus on Arnold C. Um, but for those of you that have actually taken those cor courses, um, first of all, I'm sorry and you have my sympathy, but you also know way more about this than I do. But let's talk about writing compilers. Uh, so you wouldn't want to write the entire lexer and parser yourself. That stuff is really hard and I want to spend my time writing business code uh, in Arnold C. So luckily there's a number of frameworks in place that allow you to do this effectively, you know, simply by writing a domain specific language for your language and then you supply the translations. So we have to use some tools for this. Unfortunately, none of them are yet written in Arnold C, but there are some good ones that are available. So for years, the go-to uh, tools for these have, uh, are called, or have been Flex and Bison. So Flex performs the lexical analysis. It actually tokenizes the program that you've written. And Bison takes those tokens and generates a parser that you can use to perform translations. Uh, so this is the mascot for Bison. I'm just kidding, no, not at all. So uh, Bison, it, it, this, is the, this is the mascot, this is their webpage. Uh, it was, you know, it doesn't have a, it's open source, but it doesn't have a logo, which is really weird. Uh, here's what its documentation looks like. Um, it just kind of goes on forever. It's open source, but it's not on GitHub. Um, it, was in, it was influenced by Richard Stallman. Um, it was first created in 1988. So this kind of gives you a, an indication of kind of the age of these programs. It's also all written in C. Uh, here's the docs. Uh, you're all experts on it now. Have fun reading it. Um, so fun fact, uh, Bison and Flex are ports of even older programs. Uh, Flex is a port of a program called Lex, and Bison is a port of a program called YACC, uh, which both originated in the 1970s at Bell Labs. So everything is just ports of ports of ports of ports. Uh, YACC also stands for yet another compiler compiler. Uh, so it's a port of something but it seems like it's been lost to history. Um, so our experience of porting Arnold C code to JavaScript is just keeping with tradition. So the latest in these families of tools is called Jison. Uh, it's a port of Bison uh, and Flex. It's those, both of those tools merged into one. Uh, but it's written in JavaScript, and it's what we're going to be using to compile our Arnold C code into JavaScript. So, uh, Zach Carter uh, works for Mozilla. He created and maintains JSON. Uh, he wrote it for a compilers class that he was taking a couple of years ago, and it's actually the same tool that's used by the CoffeeScript project when it compiles uh, JavaScript or when it compiles into JavaScript. So you can install uh, JSON just using npm, and here's the basic shell of a JSON program. So you pass in a structured grammar file into JSON, and it generates a parser. Uh, you can then run the parser against an input string, which is just your in original source code. So let's check out this grammar file. 
So there's three sections to a grammar file. This uh, format dates way back to the days of Lex, so the 1970s or so. Uh, the top part is the Lexer. Uh, this defines all of the keywords and tokens that your programming language requires. Um, a lot of these can be like regular expressions or they might just be strings for your keywords. The next part is the language grammar. Uh, these are the rules that determine what kind of statements are legal in your program and which ones should generate syntax errors. Um, this part looks kind of familiar to BNF if you ever had to uh, create a BNF uh, flow for a programming language in school or elsewhere. And then finally, you provide a set of transformations that are going to be applied to your abstract syntax tree. So in the case of JavaScript, we're going to be using, or in the case of JSON, we'll be using JavaScript to perform this step. So the Lexer, it's just a series of mappings uh, that define which tokens are available. Uh, so the keywords, punctuation, anything else needs to be accounted for. And each of those tokens gets a name, and that's what gets returned on the right-hand side. You can also use regular expressions uh, to define your tokens, which you're probably going to need to do for numbers, variables, strings, anything that has some dynamic as aspect to it. And most lexers are also going to have a section that uh, ignores white space and just eliminates them entirely so it doesn't return a value, and also takes the end of file character into account. So here's part of the lexer that Arnold C has. As you can see, most of these tokens are keywords. Um, so Arnold C, like most modern languages, have very few extraneous curly braces, semicolons, or other diacritic marks that get in your way. So you know, before you decide to abandon JavaScript to work in Go or some other language, you know, give Arnold C a try. Uh, you, might also, I, you might also notice how the regular expression for number is defined here, uh, but it doesn't include a decimal. Uh, I guess there is a negative, but there's no decimals. So in an Arnold C, all, all numbers are unsigned integers. Uh, decimals aren't allowed. I mean, it's just the essence of simplicity. I think that Rich Hickey would be proud. <laughs> so the next section is the language grammar. Uh, basically, you're going to take the tokens that you've defined in the section above, and you compose them into more complex trees to generate your trees on trees on trees, which it creates your abstract syntax tree by the end. So the way, that, the way that you read this is on the left-hand side, you have uh, an expression, which you name. On the right-hand side, the token, token, token part, uh, you define what constitutes that expression. This usually references some of the tokens and the keywords that you've defined in the first two sections. And then inside the curly braces, you put in what code you want JSON to execute when it's transpiling your input sources into your generated code. And that's where the JavaScript actually happens. So you can also define an expression by itself recursively. Uh, this is really useful whenever you're creating trees of statements. So this is an imaginary language um, for some expression. So an expression in this case, if we're reading from the bottom up, it can be a number, it can be the irrational numbers e or the values e and pi. Um, it could be a left parenthesis, some expression, and then the right parenthesis, or then any of these operations. Um, and what that means is that you can put as many parentheses around your code as you want, and it will still be interpreted by the language as, uh, as an expression, because it just recursively checks itself for these values. So this becomes super powerful so that you don't have to define every single permutation of how an expression should work. You just define it by itself, and it starts working. So each of these expressions will have some code that's executed with it. And here's what that JavaScript might look like. So notice there's a couple of magic symbols in here. Um, don't worry, all the dollar signs doesn't mean that we're in an Angular or a jQuery world. Uh, they just represent references to parts of an expression. So in this case, the double dollar is the left-hand section uh, of the expression. So that's, that references the same thing that we're trying to define. Uh, and then the dollar one and dollar three are the first and third items on the right-hand side of that expression. So they're the actual string values that are in your input source for that section of, or for that uh, part of the statement. So there's a couple of other uh, special elements on here that we'll talk about in just a bit. Um, a bit of structural advice whenever you're creating a program using JSON. Uh, you can extract all of these uh, JavaScript translations into a separate file. Uh, and in this case, we're defining them in ast.js, um, and then we're exporting it using the standard node common.js package. 
Uh, this is super useful because in your AST file, because that is just pure JavaScript, uh, you can require and structure your translation just like you would want them. Um, and then in your shell code, the actual transpiler, um, you just require that AST file and then, you and then you slam it in under the YY variable. And that YY corresponds to the YY that's in your BNF file. So this is just a good way of structuring your program. Um, note the YY, this is a convention from way back in the YACC days. I wanted to know a little bit more about why that happened, or why, why that happened. Uh, this is from the YACC manual way back in 1978. Um, notice this, this section that says, uh, the YACC parser uses only names beginning in YY. The user should avoid such names. So here's a lesson in the legacy and power of names, as well as um, you know, the, the history that your software can have. So when you're writing your Arnold C programs, you probably want to give some thought as to whether or not people 37 years from now will be able to understand the names that you're putting in. I would recommend avoiding using uh, you know, transitive or ephemeral uh, words like YOLO or Fleek or React. Just kidding, React's probably going to be around longer. <laughs> anyway, uh, here's a program definition. Um, note that we're taking the $1, and that's all of the methods that are being declared before the main, the it show time. And then we're hoisting the number five, so all the functions that are defined after uh, the you have been terminated, uh, but before the end of the file. And in this case, we are taking those first methods, concatenating the ones at the bottom, so we're hoisting them up, and then we're putting all of our main functions at the bottom. It doesn't have to be done this way, but you know it's our compiler, so we're in charge of how we want it to work. Um, also note the, uh, oh yeah, and then we're putting our statements uh, for it show time, that just goes straight in the middle. Also note the, uh, the app two and app four. These return uh, objects into your compiler that represent the uh, line and column coordinates of the right-hand side token that corresponds here. This is really useful for when we're creating source maps, which we'll talk about in just a second. Here's a list of all the possible statements in Arnold C. Uh, these are the leafs in the trees of statements that will be going into your main function or your program. Uh, there's kind of an eye chart, but you can kind of see what the pattern of how this all works. So for every kind of statement, we're calling out to a function that's declared on that YY object, uh, and we're passing in coordinates and token values. Um, note there are two definitions of assignment expression, one with an ops keyword and one without. These are calling the same JavaScript generator, it's just that the one without ops uh, gets an empty array, so we're able to reuse our same uh, compiler and translation step for both of these. Uh, here's an example of the translation code for the print expression, also known as talk to the hand. Um, it's written using ES6 classes, although after watching the keynote today, I'll be curious as to whether or not this is still following along. I found it to be simpler, but we'll, uh, we'll see. So, wish me luck. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the important part is that when we new up one of these objects, data goes into the constructor, aka the line and column values for source map purposes, and the value of the thing that we actually want to print. There's also a compile function, which when we call, uh, it actually generates the code. So in this case, um, we're just putting in, to generate it in JavaScript, we're just calling console.log, setting the value, we're compiling that value, and then we're closing off our parentheses. So, that's the basics of, of how it works. Uh, here's what's kind of going on. So Jason is walking the source tree. It's producing this intermediate representation, our AST. Uh, we're newing up a whole bunch of objects. That's where those classes were. And um, then we're containing all of the data inside of those classes. Uh, once we're done walking the entire source tree, we'll just call compile at the very top level. And then it'll do its thing, call compile on all these subleafs. Uh, and then once every, and uh, so for your entire syntax tree, each of those elements are going to get compiled, so on and so on and so on. And you can see that's kind of all that the main expression is doing. So in this case, it's just, um, you know, putting, it's wrapping everything inside of an iffy for encapsulation purposes. Uh, and then it's taking all of these statements, so just your array of statements that have uh, been defined in your constructor, and it's just calling compile on each of them, mapping them to a set of strings, and returning that back. So what you end up getting back is a string or an error if there's like a syntax failure or some sort of parsing error, et cetera. Um, and then you can write that out to a file or do whatever you want with that value. So 
Uh, enough talk, let's actually see what some of this looks like. So, uh, let's see. I should have got this stuff set up originally, sorry. Is this, yes. Cool, can folks see that? And, no, nope, 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 nope. All right, we're gonna get through this, guys. Where did my, oh, here it is. I'm losing everything. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Let's go back. So, uh, this is the Hello World. Can folks see this? Kind of, okay. So, uh, this is our code. If we run it through the compiler, arnoldc.js, what it produces is a uh, hello world.arnoldc and then that source map file. And now we can actually run it through just node hello world.arnoldc.js, and if it works, yes, and it actually did its right thing. So if we actually look at what is being generated, um, this is that iffy, there's a use strict declaration, uh, and then our console.log. So that's our compiled code, and then we have that source map thing, which I promise I'll get to. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other ones, so if we look at the method, uh, this is um, the modulo2 is the function, uh, and all that it does is just prints out hello, uh, hasta la vista baby, and then our main function just calls it. So if we were to run that, oops. right, we just declare our function, uh, and then our main function just calls this directly. And it does all the right stuff. And uh, this will, or this should also, if I actually make this change, ooh, what is happening here? Oh, it's Tmux. So it's actually doing the right thing behind the, oh man, this is actually working, awesome. Okay, cool. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so there's there's a number of different uh, examples in here. Um, the one that's probably most important to the, those of you that will be applying for Arnold C jobs here in the future is FizzBuzz. So we can take a look at what that code looks like. So um, uh, there's some uh, uh, enterprising folks out in GitHub that have re-implemented the standard FizzBuzz program where you print the numbers one through 100. If they're divisible by three, you put in, you type out Fizz. If they're divisible by five, you type out uh, Buzz. And if it's by 15, you type out FizzBuzz. So somebody wrote it out in Arnold C. Um, the main function, if it's less than 100, it's gonna set the N using the get to the chopper keyword. Uh, and it's actually, there's, there's a lot of code in here. It's 88 lines long, uh, which is interesting. But, uh, but if we run it through the compiler, it actually gets down to 58 lines, which is weird. Usually compiled code gets bigger, but I don't know. And anyway, uh, but actually does the right thing. So you're all experts and you're gonna be able to go program in Arnold C uh, for your jobs now. So awesome, sweet guys. So uh, let's go to, am I going the wrong way? Okay. So let's go back to our code. Where is my plus? Oh, where'd it go? Ah, computers. 
Okay. Scope. No, wrong one. Okay. So, we're back. Okay, so that's cool, but you might have seen those .map files. Those are source maps. Um, here's the last part of that compile.js file. It has just those comments, and then the pragma that says source mapping URL. Um, this is a reference to a file that actually gets generated by these uh, Arnold C compiler as well. Uh, here's what the source map file looks like. Everybody got that? All right, good, we're good to go. Uh, luckily, you never actually have to write one of these yourself. Uh, there's a module in NPM that you can use to generate source maps yourself. Um, the source map uh, module was written by Nick Fitzgerald. He also works at Mozilla, and he's one of the co-authors of the source map spec. Um, to use it, you just grab a source node object from the NPM module. Uh, you new one up, you return it, uh, and then you take the line and column information from the original source, the name of the file that the source map was generated from, and that compiled string that you had. So uh, in our case, we have a helper method on the, on the parent class to generate a source node, uh, and this can be chained. So uh, we can start with our iffy add all the child statement, each of which also returns a source node as well. So that's what the main expression now looks like. Um, so we're just starting off with our .sn, uh, generating our initial value, and then mapping out each of those child elements are now passing in their source node information as well. Um, and then we also have to pass in some um, parameters into our compile. But the end result is that uh, we have our abstract syntax tree, but instead of returning a bunch of strings when we run compile, it's actually just returning a set of source nodes. So uh, once you're done with this, there's a source node API that lets you take the compiled source and it can also return the source map. And then you just need to write them to separate files, put a reference in your compiled source to that source map, and you're good to go. So the end result of this is that it allows for your mapping of the original source code to your generated or transpiled code. So in the current situation where browsers don't know how to execute Arnold C code natively, um, but you still want to be able to perform debugging, that's where source maps really become powerful. Uh, and there's really good browser support for it. Um, you just deliver your compiled code and the source map file goes along for the ride into production. And then when you open up the developer tools, the browsers will read it in and everything just kind of works the way that you would expect. So uh, to see what this looks like let, in practice, let's actually get to the chopper. So uh, what I will do is, let's go over here. And let's start this up. Where is my mouse? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So this is a this is a tool called Source Map Visualization. Um, I didn't write this, but there's a lot of really cool things that are going on here. So. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to show was, so uh, this allows you to pass in your source map. So in this case, I'll take my generated JavaScript file, and then you provide the source map. And this will show you, oh, let me make that a little bigger. So on the left is the original source files, uh, and then on the right is the generated code. And whenever you mouse over something, uh, you can see the generated code and what it maps to on the uh, in your original files. So the hey Christmas tree, you can see that's setting your uh, variable multiple. The no problemo turns to true. Stick around is while is less than 100. Um, so this is just a nice way of visualizing from left to right how your transpiled and original sources are are mapping to each other. Uh, side note, if you're writing compilers, this tool is invaluable as a debugging purpose. Um, usually, if you're just using a generated tool, then you can just open up your dev tools and things will kind of work the way that you would expect. But, in the, uh, but whenever you're building something, that's where this becomes really useful. So hopefully now you can kind of see the power of Arnold C. Uh, but a fantastic pure language like this isn't enough by itself. Right, if, you know, if you want to know the history of great languages that died due to a lack of tooling, go find a small talk programmer and talk to them. 
So before you talk to your boss and try to convince them that it's time to abandon Clojure and migrate all of your programs to Arnold C, you need to make sure that all of your workflow tools support the language that we all know and love. So traditionally, the compiler for Arnold C has only worked with Java. Um, but because that we're in the world of JavaScript, and thanks to tools like Browserify, we can generate ex executable Arnold C code in the browser itself. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm running Browserify on the Arnold C library itself. Uh, let me make this a little bigger. And I'll start by running my Arnold C code. Let's see if I can. Oh, also, if, you, um, if you're like me and you've remapped your caps lock to the control key, uh, it's really hard to write Arnold C because everything has to be in capitalized. So just be aware of that. So as I'm typing, um, you know, this isn't valid Arnold C yet because I don't have both it's showtime and you have been terminated. But it is now. Uh, and now it, it runs over here. So if I then put, uh, you know, talk to the hand. Now it's my console.log. And if I open up the developer tools, uh, you can see those parse errors that we were having, and I'll just tell it to run. And oh, look at that. It's working. Oh, man, this is sweet. Uh, so uh, you can also. So here's the square loop. This is just taking a loop from the values 1 through 10, and it's executing on the squares of them. Um, but if we wanted to do something like, uh, yeah. So maybe instead of incrementing by 1, we can increment by 2, and we'll just see what happens. So now it's just multiplying. So instead of it's 1, 3, et cetera. So, real time, like you haven't had the power of Arnold C until you started running it in the browser itself, <laughs> which is really important. Um, maybe you're using some sort of task runner like Gulp. Uh, luckily, there's also an Arnold C uh, plugin for that. So, let's see what that looks like. So, uh, here's, a, here's a nice big um, Gulp file. Uh, <laughs> So you can see there's a gulp.arnoldc. And if we run through, so this is just, you know, it's doing standard gulp stuff. So we're taking all the Arnold C files. We're saying I want to use source maps and just piping them into Arnold C. And assuming that this all works, uh, it's going to compile all our stuff for us. Uh, oh, yes, so now we have our localhost 4000. So I'll go to the examples three. So this is just a little Angular app that shows um, a whole bunch of different, oh, yeah, so up in Nebraska, we decided to have a, a war about compiled languages. And I'm pretty sure that Arnold C1, but um, <laughs> yeah. So this is just fizzbuzz. Uh, if I open up the developer tools, you can also see that things were printed out appropriately. Um, if we go to the, if you click on it, so this is the source maps in action. So this is actually the original Arnold C code, uh, and it's it's pretty sweet. So we can actually put breakpoints in, and so if I refresh the page, uh, and then you can actually step through the Arnold C code. Uh, and if we, you know, if we watch, I think we can actually see this do its thing. Yeah, so, and this shows all the original values. So, you know, you don't, you don't ever have to get out of the world of Arnold C um, once your source maps start working. That, that cognitive shift just goes away. So that's really important. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting to note here is that um, this is uh, an Angular controller that's written in Arnold C. So you can actually write, so if you're angry that Angular 2 requires you to write your stuff in TypeScript, um, don't worry about it. Just write your stuff in Arnold C and you'll be fine. You do have to kind of cheat a little bit. Um, there's not a really easy way to set a value for this. So in this case, I'm calling the, I'm using the do it now to execute the eval 
function. Uh, you know, that's probably going to be some sort of code smell. Um, so just make sure that when you're, whenever you're doing your code reviews on your Arnold C code, that uh, it's, you know, that you're, you're finding things like this. Do we have linters written yet for Arnold C? That is an opportunity uh, in the waiting, sir. <laughs> Um, and if you want to incorporate Arnold C into a larger project, you might want to use a bigger like module loader, uh, such as Webpack. Uh, luckily, Arnold C also has you covered there. So let's go back. So in this case, uh, our Webpack config um, just says for any Arnold C file that you have, run it through the Arnold C loader. Uh, and then the main file is app.js. So all of this is doing is just saying require uh, and then our Arnold C code. So this is the same FizzBuzz program. And then if I run Webpack, oh no. What's going on? Oh, it's because that I have something else that is currently running. Is that right? I think so. Okay, so now it's running on localhost port 8080. Oop. Where is it going? Okay, nope, not 4000, 8080. So uh, you can see that here is just the, the original Webpack code. Uh, if, and if we were to make a change to this, So instead of saying fizz buzz, maybe I'll say buzz fizz. And we go back to our code. Uh, we should see, yeah, so it's, it's done all of web, so all the beauty of Webpack and it's like live reloading and hot reloading. Again, you don't have to throw that away just because you're writing your code in Arnold C. Um, you're getting the best of all possible worlds. So that's really good. And here's something else that no other language has as far as I'm aware. Uh, it's called the Arnold C speaker. And I'm just going to demo it so that you can kind of see what, what it does. So I didn't write this, but it's, uh, yeah. OK, localhost 9090. OK, so uh, here is your hello world. It's showtime. Talk to the hand. You are terminated. Uh, the factorials. It's showtime. Hey, Christmas tree! You sales, ah! Talk to the hand. Get your ass to Mars. Do it now! I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And I want to have them answered like immediately. Ten minutes. I'm just going to play hey, this Christmas the entire tree. time. You sales, uh, ah! So, so if you really want to get good at Arnold C, then I would recommend putting on a blindfold, uh, just hitting play, and see if you can execute the same code that the Arnold C compiler is making available <laughs> to you. Um, the answer is probably, uh, you know, that's, that's really what, you know, when, when the Arnold C ecosystem starts getting hot, that's going to separate you from the rest of the pack. So that'll be really important to work on. Anyway. So, in the rare case that maybe you don't think that Arnold C is the right language for you to write all of your production code in, that's okay. Um, you can build your own compiler. You can take the guts of the program and implement your own compile to JavaScript language. Uh, you might want to write a domain specific language that can be executable in any browser. Or maybe you have a whole lot of code that's written in some legacy language that you don't, that you're not ready to actually perform a port of, you just want to continue running the original source. Or maybe you just want to have a little fun, right? That's okay as well. But when you're ready for a truly powerful language, Arnold C will be there just waiting for you to recall it, totally. <laughs> and on that note, uh, that's all that I have. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>